it's about recall that pride is actually a liberation movement. That's what it was about. It was gay pride, it was a liberation movement. It still is a liberation movement. It's not just a corporate event. And this film, having this film on as part of gay pride and part of the Council for Ex-Muslims involvement in gay pride has been a struggle. Because for the first time, and I have to thank Daniel Fitzgerald for uh, facilitating CMB's entrance into the Pride March last year yeah. and for organizing this event and all the hard work he's put into it, finding the gallery and so on. Um, last year when we marched in Pride, uh, we ran into a whole lot of problems and we're going to discuss them at greater length afterwards. Um, but one of the problems was that there was a clash between us and people who wanted to defend Muslim fundamentalists, uh, either criticize Islam or Islamic fundamentalism. And particular mosques, there were only some specific mosques that we named in our banners, and there was an attack on us as Islamophobes for pointing out that those mosques, the Green Lanes Mosque in Birmingham, but particularly in London, they noticed that we had criticized the East London Mosque. And pr the pride, the corporate pride event, apologized to the East London Mosque for causing um, offense. So it's in that context that we've had actually a year-long set of very difficult discussions and campaigns within the movement of Pride, and which, which Daniel and Jimmy and various others was, were very central to, uh, in order to make sure that we could march in Pride again, not be designated Islamophobes, and uh, to spread the understanding of what our movement is about, no. we're going to show you uh, this film about CEMB, which is now 10 years old. And the film was made by Dia Khan, who's a, 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 an award-winning director, who made it with great care. It faced a huge backlash uh, as soon as it came out, with the result that one of the people who had agreed to participate wanted to be taken out of the film. So it had to be recut. Uh, and some of that backlash was from the fundamentalists and from the regressive left and from various other people, but some of it, unfortunately, was also from gay Muslims. So although ex-Muslims see their liberation movement as very analogous to the gay liberation movement because they have similar issues of coming out, uh, addressing religion, talking to their families, being safe, illegality in certain states and so on, that recognition has not always come back towards ex-Muslims. Uh, from the gay Muslim community. And today we hope to have a discussion which will bring these two groups together, the ex-Muslims and some gay Muslim groups, so that we have a civilized discussion around some of these discourses and prepare to celebrate pride together and to support our common struggles against people who want to kill both gays and ex-Muslims. Okay? part of as well. Uh, there's a commemoration for Grenfell taking place at the other end of London, there's a march. Um, there are many forms of injustice happening and the kinds of issues we discussed, the film was made what, a year or so ago? Or more? Two, years. Two years ago now. Um, but they're still current. We're still hearing about murders happening in Bangladesh right now. In fact, just today we found out about somebody who'd been killed. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, and another person who just showed up to the Yeah, There's another one. There are two different people. There are people all the time. So I am not going to say much except to just introduce um, the speakers. Sadia's, who you saw in the film, is going to kick off. And um, She is a spokesperson of the Council of Ex-Muslims and has been featured in the film, of course. Uh, she's a human rights activist and honor-based forced marriage and FGM consultant based in Gloucestershire, working in the sexual violence field with a focus on black minority ethnic women. And she organized a hugely successful event titled Let's Talk Honor in 2016. Uh, which was held at Gloucester University. She also launched Critical Sisters, and she's a winner of ICRO, which is the Iranian and Kurdish Women's Rights Organization Special Recognition Activist Award of 2017. Thank you very much. Um, I actually want to start off.
off by thanking our volunteers because we've got some really, really badass volunteers who worked really bloody hard. Um, namely Daniel, actually, who this event wouldn't be happening if it was Daniel. 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 Thank you, Daniel. And Sina, I don't know if he's in the room at the moment, but he has been at my beck and call. For any time I've called him for anything, he's just been there. Um, and actually, a lot of our events wouldn't happen if it weren't for our volunteers. So I'm really, really grateful for our volunteers to start off with. Um, so actually, I want to talk about the issue of identity, because it's quite a complex thing to negotiate. Uh, so being a Pakistani in an English majority country, that on its own is very difficult. Um, then being LGBT in a majority heterosexual situation is really, really difficult. Um, then being a, an ex-Muslim or an apostate in the, the Muslim majority community or society that you've grown up with, that's really difficult. But a combination of all three is really, really hard. So my brother was all three. He um, was British Pakistani, he was a proud atheist, an apostate, and he was bisexual. Um, something that actually my parents find increasingly difficult, and my family finds increasingly difficult. Um, after that film aired, I was accused of bringing shame on my brother. Um, because my family allegedly knew him better than I did, which is fucking shite. So when we talk about these issues, actually, when, when we talk about one of these issues, people have some understanding and some sympathy. But when these issues combine, there's less sympathy, there's less support, and there's less consideration for the people that are going through it. But I, I'm pretty certain, just from looking around the room, that everybody in this room understands what what going through at least one of these issues is. So if you're not, you know, if you're not one of those three, maybe you're just a woman growing up in a misogynistic and patriarchal world, you understand how hard that is. So that's why I'm particularly incensed when there's a complete lack of understanding when it comes to people that are going through all three of these issues, or more in some instances. I'm constantly having to police my language not to offend well-meaning ignoramuses or Muslims. So I want to pose a question to you guys, really. Um, why whenever I, have, whenever I talk about Islam, do I have to talk about our far-right far groups, the Islamists or mm -hmm. the fundamentalists or the terrorists, to justify discussing Islam, discussing some of the nasty stuff in Islam? Mm -hmm. Whenever I talk about Christianity, my go-to point doesn't have to be the Ku Klux Klan to justify homo the ho discussing homophobia or misogyny in Christianity. So why do I have to do that when it's Islam? It exists in Islam. And one recent example of that, of many I might add, was a female imam who uh, met with President Macron. There was an article in some paper, I can't quite recall the paper actually. And as I was reading it, I was thinking, yes, yes, this is fantastic. This is true progress. I'm really, really pleased. She led prayers with, without a headscarf. Uh, she conducted multi-faith marriages, something that most imams would absolutely, categorically refuse to do. Then I stopped in my tracks, actually, uh, because her sticking point mm -hmm. was gay marriage. Mm -hmm. That was when she, she, she drew a line under it. She couldn't do it anymore. So my message to Muslims today is that we won't tolerate any bigotry towards you. We will stand by you, we will support you. But we won't, won't tolerate homophobia, misogyny, bigotry towards apostates or, uh, or blasphemers in the name of building alliances. We're not gonna lower human rights standards for the sake of unhealthy relationships or alliances. We're not that desperate for your approval. As Oscar Wilde said, the worst slave owners were those that were kind to their slaves because they hide the true horrors of slavery. Mm -hmm. In the same manner, the worst 
Muslims, are those liberal progressive Muslims that rant on about misinterpretations, or those that uh, or those that constantly argue with us rather than arguing with those that popularize those nasty interpretations. Because they hide the, the true horrors of Islam, the misogyny, the homophobia, the true horrors that really do exist within Islam. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well said. Thank you. Saeed um, Ishtia Hussain Shawan is an LGBT activist from Bangladesh and editor of Boys Love World, which was established in 2011 as an online magazine for Bangladeshi LGBT activists. The mission of the magazine is to advocate and defend LGBT communities and its members, rights activists, bloggers from different countries, uh, rights activists and bloggers from different countries contribute to Boys Love World and their quality writings and engage with the readers. So the magazine has many readers, not only in Bangladesh, but around the world. Our main aim is to educate mass people about LGBT, the, the LGBT community and cultivate a sentiment in favor of equality and diversity to create a safe environment where LGBT people can promote and explore their culture and work in the interests of public benefit to remove any social exclusion. We achieve our aims and objectives by holding various events, workshops, and seminars throughout the year. Can you still hold workshops and seminars? given the situation in Bangladesh, or rainbow pride marches, which used to happen in Bangladesh. I think we need to be aware that there is a culture that's been created by activists like you, that even in conditions of illegality, there were, they may not have been called pride, but they were called rainbow marches or some kind of inclusive marches, which were uh, times when uh, the LGBT community could come out with other supporters. Because I have Bangladeshi friends who came with their children and in fact came to the Pride March here uh, when we got into such trouble. They came with their children and, and at the Pride March, a young girl was holding a banner for, for Khulhas, who was one of the Bangladeshi bloggers who was killed. Uh -huh. And she was saying for the right to love. So that's a teenage girl living in Bangladesh holding a banner mm -hmm. for the right to love because of the community that you people have created. But can you still do that? That's what I want you to talk about. In Bangladesh, uh, I... <clears throat> I don't think that it's possible to do it in that way. Because like a lot of people that try to do um, uh, protests or uh, blog or uh, writings, but it's not safe. Uh, earlier I was talking about like three days ago, another blogger has been killed, a secular publisher and writer, uh, Shahjan Bachchu. That, that gentleman, he used to write uh, uh, and uh, he used to do blogging. But he was killed. But at this moment, I don't think that it's possible to uh, uh, write or uh, be in an activism related to atheism or uh, homosexuality because, like, it's uh, the the society is not prepared to accept this uh, this uh, so-called taboo. So I think I don't think that this is possible. And my personal experience is. Um, uh, the blogger community, uh, the uh, the writers, uh, mostly they are staying outside of the Bangladesh. Uh, as you've heard, like I have been uh, composing one uh, magazine, Boys Love World, since 2011. We have been uh, publishing uh, uh, the news from the LGBT community, uh, their uh, their opinion and their stories. Um, I, I, I am associated with two other magazines um, as well. One is Atheist in Bangladesh and another one is Rupan. There comes another story. As you have heard uh, probably about Rupan, Rupan is a, 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 the only LGBT magazine in our country. It used to be, not anymore, because the previous editor, it was, uh, he was killed brutally in his home along with his friend. Uh, he is Jumas Manan, Madam, Madam was talking about Jumas Manan. We are carrying his work now. We are publishing the Rupan from the UK. I am the editor now. 
and we have already purchased the website, and we have uh, we have uh, we have published one edition already. So Rupan will be published from the UK from now on. Uh, but the question was uh, whether this is possible to do this in Bangladesh or not. This is not this is not possible in Bangladesh because like. Uh, Bangladesh has a sentiment against the ATS people and the uh, LGBT community. Uh, here's an ex uh, uh, interesting example. It's like not interesting. Like I, I find it uh, like uh, uh, angry. I find it very angry too when I think about it. Um, there were some uh, gay people. They were trying to gather 27 uh, people. Uh, I know personally two of them, and they were arrested and they were beaten. They were beaten like their nails were like torn, and they were beaten. They were saying that why do you people gather here? And that was by the state authority. So that's the thing. Another thing is like Bangladesh um, voted against a uh, proposition brought by the United Nations, uh, which was about. Uh, banning the death penalty for the LGBT people and Bangladesh including the United States voted against uh, this uh, proposition they, they that means they want to say that the LGBT community should be punished with death penalty and uh, the, the gay people should be hanged or uh, executed which is terrible and um, I have met recently Asif Muhyiddin and Arif Roman both, and we have been doing a video blogging about uh, the rights of these people. But uh, these people, they have already been attacked. People who have been um, talking or writing against, uh, you know, the religious fundamentalism, uh, been attacked. So people are very scared. People like me, we are hiding here in the, um, you know, other parts of the world except Bangladesh, uh, because uh, it's pretty dangerous. My own brother, he was killed because of uh, he belongs to a family who is, who is which is secular. My younger brother and another brother, he was attacked uh, because he is an atheist, and as I am atheist, and my my father, my uh, uncle, they made they had they were not atheists, but they were much more secular. Uh, they had a secular sentiment, uh, which was the reason that they were they uh, they were attacked a couple of times, and they killed my brother. I I was not surprised to see the videos like of the killing and the blood and the because this is pretty much the same that I experienced. My brother was stabbed, and uh, this is a fashion like uh, the. Uh, if you if a Muslim want to kill uh, someone to go to heaven, they would have they would they will kill in this similar fashion like stabbing. And my brothers, uh, it was horrible. I don't want to describe that uh, horrible um, death how they killed him. He just turned 18. He suffered you know, like the, the pain because of other people's fault. Uh, I mean the fault was done by us uh, according to Bangladeshi the Muslim community or Islamist fundamentalists. So currently Bangladeshi situation, uh, it's, um, it's, not, it's not in favor of the LGBT community or atheist community or anybody else. Um, the writers and the bloggers, they, they will not be able to say what they want to do or what they want to say. Like the secular people, secular community is uh, is not safe. So uh, currently, the situation in Bangladesh is not in favor of us. Thank you. Hello. I'd like to comment on that a little bit because a lot of people don't know the history of Bangladesh and don't realize that there are Muslim-majority countries that have secular constitutions, mm -hmm. and this was Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. It had a liberation struggle, mm -hmm. it established a secular and socialist constitution. Uh, as I said, in recent years it had the space to have rainbow marches, and it had a civil society organization. Um, and this, these events that are happening 
are a kind of dual backlash. So you have the backlash by the Islamists, some of whom have been put on trial for their role in 1971. And the atheist movement and the rationalist movement and so on were blogging and demanding these trials taking place. So there's a civil society movement that was around that issue. And that was one of the reasons. And the other was, of course, the backlash against gays, which was also part of the Islamist backlash. But both the atheists and, as you've described, the LGBT movement have had a backlash from the state, which is supposed to be a secular party and a secular state, which is on the one hand putting some people from one particular political party on trial for their role in 1971 in the liberation struggle where they led death squads and so on, mm -hmm. but at the same time trying to de actually taking on a lot of their attitudes and uh, wiping out the secular history of Bangladesh, the Hindus in the history and the culture and so on, uh, attacking atheists as if they were terrorists, just like Saudi Arabia does, and so on. I think that describes the horror that your family has faced on all sides from all these different sets of groups and, and uh, people. And thank you so much for continuing the work that was started. You know, and fortunately with the, the internet, it can be continued abroad as well. Yeah, and I mean, if I may, I want to say a few words more. It's my, 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 because if I'm a bisexual man and I compose a magazine uh, related to LGBT community and the atheist community, they have put six more uh, uh, lawsuits against me and my team and my, uh, my family. And previously, my two of my aunts, they died, they denied the state denied the treatment of the people because of uh, our family is a secular family. <coughs> they died without treatment. So this is what is going on in Bangladesh and the history of Bangladesh. It's, we, we are proud people, we have a proud history, but currently the situation is like out of control. I, I want to ask you one more question before we move on. We move on. And that is that did you find that the issues that you faced through your LGBT activism were understood by the atheist community. Quite, we know that the others are hostile to the point of murder, but even within the rationalist and you thinking and atheist community, did you find there was sympathy for your issues as LGBT activists? Um, I don't think so. I think uh, even, with, I mean, the, there, there, you can find like the atheist community, the LGBT community, sometimes not not together. But, like um, uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, mostly I get the sympathy from the atheist community or the secular community, but uh, there are sometimes um, as like uh, there are some sentiment like which are not in favor of the LGBT community, like um, probably. In future, we have a we have an intention to uh, do a, a conference. Uh, in there, we want to show the pictures of the Hijra community in Bangladesh, which is actually the gay and the transgender people. So, still, I see like people sometimes put an example like, "Oh, you're you're weaker like an Hijra." So, uh, I have I have seen this comment comment from some some of the atheist community, uh, uh, so some some atheist people. Which is like, which is not a not not an expression of sympathy. I think uh, still there is a uh, like se sentiment inside the atheist community or the other community about I mean against the LGBT community. I think uh, people need to change their perception and the views. Yeah, I think we have struggles on a lot of different fronts. So Matt, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, Thank you for coming, because uh, you're not an ex-Muslim. You're the first not ex-Muslim. So Matt Mahmood Ogston is founder and trustee of Nas and Matt Foundation. In 2001, soon after coming out to himself, Matt met his soulmate Nas in a nightclub in, Bar in Birmingham. Nas was 21, Matt was 23. They fell in love and ran away to London to be themselves and escape the intense pressure of not being out to family. It's a good reminder that we have this here as well. They had to keep their relationship a secret for fear of what might happen if they were found out. After 13 years together and engaged to be married, Naz, Dr. Nazim Mahmoud sadly took his own life. 
just two days after being confronted about his sexuality by his deeply religious family during Eid. It was the first time they had heard that their son was gay in a long-term relationship with another man, in love and planning to get married. Their solution was to tell Naz he needed to see a psychiatrist to be cured for being gay, for shame not to be brought on the family. In memory of Naz, Matt set up, Matt set up Naz and Matt Foundation, a charity that tackles religious and cultural homophobia. And the organization helps families to learn how to accept their LGBTQI plus children for who they really are and who they were born to be. The foundation's mission is never let religion, any religion, come in the way of the unconditional love between parents and their children. Thank you, Matt. Yes, um, I mean, when I met um, Naz, uh, the second question he asked me uh, after my name was, the question he asked me was, I'm a Muslim, is that going to be a problem? Now imagine being asked such a profound question, I had to give it some thought, why would he ask me such a question? Because I didn't have an issue and I didn't know why he'd asked me, so I thought long and hard about why he asked me the question. And then I realised that the, the, the friends or the people I was hanging around with at the time, they actually would have a problem. So I made a decision on that night never to see those friends ever again because what sort of friends are they that can have a problem with a man like Naz? Mm. And we fell in love um, so quickly, um, so so deeply and so intensely. And within a matter of weeks, I've moved out of my family home. I've got a flat less than um, like 500 meters from Naz's mom's house, which is a bit risky, but it was also so exciting because we could just be ourselves. But because um, now this family, they were driving instructors and they kept driving past the area. We, we kind of had to move very quickly to our own place. And after about 18 months, we, we just couldn't bear it anymore more because we couldn't walk down the street together. We couldn't hold hands. We had to the blinds closed and off our room all the time. Mm. And it just became so intense that we just had to be free. And so we, we moved down to London. And, and although Naz would identify as a Muslim, he when he was in the life that he chose, the life with me in London, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't do anything um, as a, uh, like a practicing Muslim would, um, but from not eating pork. And I didn't eat pork either, and it was out of respect for his mom. And I, I stopped eating out of respect for Naz. You know, but we had the Quran um, at home. Um, Naz could read the Quran, read Arabic, he had an Arabic prayer in his um, car. But when he went back to Birmingham to be with his mom and his family, um, you know, he wouldn't take any um, British clothes with him or any kind of trousers, jeans, etc. You know, he would um, completely change his identity um, when he was in that family home. And so much so that he kept them incredibly separated from each other mm. because he didn't want to bring the stresses that he had in his family existence down to our life, which was the free life that he could be, that, he gave him, um, that he was. And although the second question he asked me was, was um, you know, I was thinking that would be a problem. And faith never, and religion never featured in our personal lives together, although we believe in a concept of religion, um, and we believe there's good bits in all religions. We believe in spirituality, we believe in good karma, treating other, you know, each other with respect. So much so that um, when Naz was confronted about his sexuality, it was completely um, unexpected. It was, um, it was something that Naz thought he would um, he thought he probably would never do. Something he wanted to do, but he thought it might never ever happen. And when that moment happened, he, he was confronted, um, he broke down into tears. Conversation which I can't really share now, but, but it, it broke him down into such a, a state that you know, one of his parents had to ask him, why are you crying, why are you crying, is it because you like men? And the things that was said to him, and Naz told me everything, we talked about everything. The things that were said to Naz, the things that were, we talked about for the next two days before Naz sadly passed away. And then the things that the family said to me afterwards, less than 24 hours after he passed away. I was told by one of the parents, do you realise that Naz was living in sin because of his religion? This was less than 24 hours. And do you realise you're also living in sin because of your religion? And the, the actions and the beliefs that they, they took really is what triggered um, part of the foundation to be doing 
what we're doing where our mission is to never let religion, any religion, come in between the unconditional love of a parent and a child. And that's not to say to a parent you have to leave your religion, you have to put that faith, your belief system behind, but just put it to the side just enough so you can just you know put out your arms and just give your, your child a big hug and just tell them you love them. Just just put whatever system or whatever book or whatever belief that you have, just put it to the side just enough, just to love your kid, the one that you gave birth to, because we're all born equal. And if, if you want to blame anyone, blame yourself because you gave birth to this beautiful child. And so what we try and do is, is try and connect to parents' hearts and minds, not by telling them what they can or can't think, but really to try and touch their hearts just enough to realise that the impact they're having on their child they might actually lose forever, like I've sadly lost my dad. And the impact of um, Naz's story is, is, is really, I think, is what why people contact us, they hear about the story. And the, our personal story was documented in great detail in, in The Guardian. Um, it took them three months to write that article. Um, and when they published it, um, a lot of things started to happen. And, and that article, it's the most accurate account of what happened in our relationship. And how Naz sadly passed away. And that article, I think Naz would be, <coughs> never find the right words, but I think in some way Naz would be looking down and somehow pleased with something that's happened is that we've had people contact us and say that story, individuals, young gay Muslim men have actually printed the story off, they've put it on their coffee table and then they've left the house and then they've come back several hours later to see what happened mm -hmm. because they realised that their parents could understand that this is what might happen to their own child if they don't open up then they need to open up and they need to start listening to their child. And, and thankfully, in, in the cases that we've been told, with that story's been left on the coffee table. Those, those, those individuals have become very strong and become advocates and ambassadors in their life to the LGBT courts. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask, um, what's been the success rate with um, missing parents and children, etc.? Talia is asking about the success rate with Muslim parents. Sorry, I'm no. <laughs> Well, we don't, I mean, we're a very small charity, incredibly small, so we don't keep statistics. But what we do have is the, the individual stories that get sent to us. Um, like, we, we've just been nominated for the award, and part of that process, people have to put in <coughs> messages about why they've nominated us. Mm. And what was really fascinating was to see individual stories from people that I've never heard of before. They've never contacted us, so I don't know who they are. But they say, <coughs> Because of hearing what happened to Naz and now what you're doing, um, I was able to come out to my parents. And although the relationship might not be as strong as I needed to be, but I'm out and I'm now and I'm safe and I'm free. <coughs> and it's, it's, it's those stories that keep us going to know that we must be on the right track. Because none of this was a, a, a strategy. We didn't sit down and go, what are we going to do? It was literally we wait for people to come to us and let them ask for what we want, they want our help with. And since then, we've We've managed to, um, you know, we've got a children's book because um, we do lots of school talks. But they obviously have. So yeah, thank yeah. you, Matt. Mm -hmm. And thank you for coming and sharing this panel today. It's in enormously important to us because I'm not an ex Muslim, but I'm an atheist. But, the, but my close colleague, uh, Yasmin Rahman, who many of you know yeah. from. Uh, various um, events, supports, with all her heart, CMD, and we work together. So we've always been looking for openings to work together, instead of having a process of denunciation which doesn't allow that space for the dialogue to take place. And I think at, at this moment it's probably quite important for us to mention, so off the back of last year's Pride March, um, there were several complainants to uh, Pride itself, Pride also. Um, it took nearly a year for us to be allowed back at Pride, and we thankfully have been allowed back, but it has been a bit of a struggle. Probably a bit of an understatement, isn't it? It has been a struggle. We've had to justify all of our actions. And every single complainant was invited to this panel today. Not one single one of them has come to defend their position mm -hmm. or justify their actions or behaviours mm -hmm. all the length of time they took to, to respond. Mm -hmm. You know, 
uh, Iman, who we support wholeheartedly because it, there's a very fine line between being ex-Muslim and gay and Muslim and gay. We absolutely support the work that they, that they do. We might not believe, have the same belief system, but we do support them, and we would, always. They haven't come. Uh, MEND was invited, that was one of the main complainants, which is a, uh, an Islamist group, by the way, but we were willing to have a conversation with them. Um, the East London Mosque, who has invited well over 10 homophobic speakers in the last 10 years to speak at their mosque. Mm -hmm. They were also a complainant um, uh, to pride against us. Mm -hmm. They were invited, they just fobbed us off, didn't bother responding to the emails. Um, pride herself was invited to come and take part in the panel. They haven't, they haven't turned up. Mm. Um, fortunately, someone from Pink News is actually here, but we've had several derogatory and offensive emails from Pink News mm -hmm. published about CEMB's involvement in Pride, and they're not here on this panel to justify their position on, on CEMB, but they're quite happy to write quite nasty stuff about us in the press. Mm -hmm. And actually we went out of our way to invite every single one of them because we know we, we don't want to sit here and argue, but we do want to have a discussion. That's important. You can only change uh, people's minds. You don't even, actually, I'm not going to get on my high horse. I don't think I'm that amazing about uh, changing people's minds, but at least it's uh, courteous to sit and have a discussion if you're going to slate us in public. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. That was one of the reasons we're showing this, because of all the discussions and the arguments that took place last year at Pride. And I was also involved with my friend Yasmin, who sits on the Hate Crimes Committee. It's an expert committee of independent experts that reports to the Home Office. And in 2013, when some of the first um, leaflets, uh, the, the movement that was mentioned in the film, uh, started circulating about people labeled as atheists who were basically bloggers and writers on, on social media and, and running various social media platforms. And mosques in Britain were circulating these leaflets. And they were naming people, they were showing their Facebook pages, they were showing statements they'd made that were horrific statements about Islam and, uh, the, and labeling them as atheists. Now, at the same time, I mean, none of them had a death threat involved. So we were saying to the police, these are hate crimes. Because the hate crimes experts that I worked with, of whom my, my Muslim colleague, Yasmin Rahman, is one who sits on the Home Office, uh, the, the home, the home office com Expert Committee, plus other experts from um, you know, former policemen and academic experts, <laughs> said that attacks on atheists should be protected under current hate crimes legislation because they fall under religion or belief. Right. It's not just religion. It's not just people being attacked on religious grounds. It's people being attacked on religion or belief grounds, which means that under current reg legislation, they should be protected. And the police who tried to take down our Allah's gay banners and other banners that we were carrying, and have subsequently used, uh, uh, actually banned a, a far right group who was using the same thing, trying to climb onto that and use that thing. But using that issue, not other issues that they might be using to stir hatred, but using that issue to ban them from the country, those same police were basically muttering, they didn't dare say it to my face, but they were muttering to other people on the committee that actually CEMB had committed a hate crime, that we might be charged with it. Uh, when I went and argued with them, uh, they defended their relationship with various Islamist groups. They said, as police, we have to talk to everybody. They're very angry with the government for stopping them talking to Islamists. And they said, we have to talk to everyone. I said, I agree. You know, In defense of this country, there is a security threat. You have to talk to everybody. That doesn't mean you treat them as partners. There's a distinction made. And they said, we talk to criminals, we talk to all sorts of violent people. I said, I agree. Talk to everybody. You have to know what they're up to. By all means, have cups of tea with them. Don't treat them as people that you actually treat as your partners to decide who are the threat. So, you know, here in Britain, where apostasy is not a crime and blasphemy is not a crime, and, you know, having any form of LGBT identity is not a crime, we were still being treated as a hate group for what we had done. And 
we also found in the meeting with, with the senior most officer or the lead on hate crime, Scott Hilliard, who, by the way, was at the march with you know, a pride, you know, rainbow colors on his cheeks and so on. Um, but he said that we do not report to the government on this issue. There's no, uh, there's no line of reporting on crimes against atheists. So that's actually an issue that we're working on together. We're still trying to collect information on that the, there is nowhere that actually these reports are being taken up. And I know this from my own knowledge that people don't, you have been to the police with people, they will not register the case, you know? Yeah. And in one case where somebody had been sent an ISIS banner with some verse on it, they said, this was examined by the counterterrorism people, and they said, oh, this is just a verse from the Quran, there's no threat here. And then I got him months to look at it, so we had our own expert, CMB expert, to look at it. And he said, this is the verse that's used to attack minorities. And it, it is the verse that signals, you know, these are the people you should kill. It is, yes, it's a verse from the Quran, but it's the threatening verse that's used for these purposes. So, you know, that, that's where you hear a lot from the Islamists about how bad prevent is and so on. But I'm telling you what our experience is, when there, there's a very serious threat, and we can't even register it. It's like trying to register an FIR, a case yeah. in India or Pakistan or Bangladesh. We can't register it, let alone have it acted on. Because it's not even taken seriously. No, it's worse than not taken seriously. It's taken seriously enough to examine and then, then push reject. To side. But then what happens with those individuals is once you, um, once you do go to the authorities and you do tell them that something's happened, if you've been let down by those authorities, you're less likely to go back to the authorities. You're less likely, I mean, think about it, you get a shitty service at an organisation, are you going to go back to go coffee or breakfast to that organisation? Absolutely not. And it's exactly the same with these service sectors, these, these organisations that are supposed to safeguard us, that are supposed to take care of us. If you get a bad response, if you're not taken seriously once, you're not going to go there again. Which we know from our other work on women's rights and hate crimes and so on. Can I just add one thing to... Sure. To, um, the, so, our foundation works across different faiths um, and cultures and religions. And the, the, the challenges and the issues that we face, they're, they're, they're pretty much common across all the faiths and, and individuals that we actually work with. And sometimes some families will actually blame their religion, it's like their religion has been the reason why they're allowed to hold these views. But then the same narrative with a different family, they're actually blaming the culture and the religion is not going to pass that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, so, I think what's really important is, is, is particularly the, the, the work that we do, is that it's common, again, it's common in belief systems. And it's not the thing, is it's the misinterpretation which the family takes, and that's what we need to really challenge, is why they hold that misinterpretation. Because the, the religious text remains constant. You can have different people um, interpreting in different ways. So if it's the text that remains constant, but it's the people's attitudes that change from family to family, why do we? Why does that happen? That needs to be well, we're going to address that a little bit later, I think, with, yeah. with Jimmy. But let me let me just read Said's thing because I want you to uh, give you plenty of space. But Said Heather, who unfortunately we can't have, Matt had helped us um, uh, get his agreement to come on the panel, but he sent profuse apologies. He's overwhelmed with work. He's an academic. He's marking papers and so on at the moment. He's, he's Said Heather, and in his academic job, he's head of academic subjects. Uh, in, at um, Royal Holloway um, University of London. He's also chair of Hidayah, which is why we'd invited him here, an LGBTQI plus organization looking to support LGBT plus Muslims and work with allies in promoting a critical understanding of Islam and Islamic aid traditions. And he's published a number of articles, most recently on the shootings in Orlando, uh, and shadows on the wall in gay times, and his research interests lie in culture and the role of cultural products in the transmission of ideas. Um, and he's also got a monograph coming on Muslim modernities on the Hindi screen. So I'm going to read him out. I'm being Saeed Heather for, for this, um, for the moment, um, because he, he was very kind enough to watch the film. He hadn't watched it earlier, so he, was, he actually did watch it and has uh, sent some responses. Uh, to it. So let me begin by thanking CAMB for their warm invitation to attend this evening and my sincerest apologies for my absence. 
I regret not being there with you all for what is likely to be a most engaging and thought-provoking evening. In the absence, please let the following words be my contribution to the discussion that will follow the screening of Dia Khan's moving portrayal of the challenges faced by those who lead Islam. I had not watched the documentary until the invitation was extended to me, and so I thought it only proper that I, pre I ought to prepare in some way by doing my homework and reflecting a little before the event on the themes that come out in the film. What struck me powerfully was the empathy that it was evoked in me. I, a believing Muslim, had a strong reaction of wanting to reach out to those who felt such pain at the loss and estrangement from loved ones. I was horrified by the terrible violence inflicted on those who dared to speak out against Islam or Islamism. Certain images were haunting, and if you have just watched the documentary, you can imagine the pictures I am thinking of. Was it curious, though, that I, someone who affirms his Muslim faith and finds it hard to hear it spoken of badly, or indeed recoils when someone says that they do not like Islam, should have been able to feel such a pang of emotion at the pain pictured in the film? Of course not. It occurred to me that even though I disagree profoundly with much of what is said about Islam, and do not relate to the loss of faith experienced by ex-Muslims, my reaction was not to the discursive reality to which the documentary contributes as a cultural product, but the embodied identities of the participants in the film who's the, who, whom the visual medium had captured. Those individuals who had the privilege of listening to and gazing into their eyes and watching were not ex-Muslims only. They were bodies in pain, individuals who were suffering and calling out for understanding. Theirs was an emotion which, though generating from a specific context, no doubt, was nonetheless universal because it was an emotion experienced in and through the body. And in that moment, my body absorbed that pain. I'm interested in the way that identity politics is largely premised on discursive grounds. Identity is constructed through language and discourse, given enormous power through polemic, and used sometimes to justify monstrous actions against other identities similarly, constru similarly constructed. It seemed to me that in these ways, discursive identities get in the way of getting along. In what is a tr tragic irony, identities constructed through language and discourse actually identify language and its ability to build bridges. Here we may be better served then by remembering that discursive identities are always secondary. They are writ large on bodies which stand and offer another way to commune with other human beings, animals, and the world itself. An embodied identity is one which foregrounds the aesthetic because the aesthetic is the realm of sensation. Beauty and nourishment, meeting and embracing, reaching out and holding are all means of encountering the other that lies beneath the discourse. I smiled because how wonderful is it that this idea sparked by a documentary about ex-Muslims in the month of Ramadan made me want to sit down and open my iftar with all of them from the film, to have a meal because that's what bodies need, nourishment, physical, emotional, and if you're that way inclined, spiritual. Thank you. Say. <laughs> Now, had Saeed been here, I'd have asked him the question that I asked. He has sort of explained it, but he did say when we in an email exchange that he was going to talk about the difference between embodied identities and discursive identities. Mm -hmm. And I said that, you know, we have people uh, from all kinds of backgrounds, not all of them are academic, um, and even some of the academics might struggle a little. And anyway, there are lots of people who speak English in second or third language. We, you know, we're a very diverse movement. <laughs> Um, and so uh, would he explain himself? And I'd st I struggled with it, and I think, and I wish he were here to answer, that I think what he's suggesting is, as he said, the pain is embodied, and he felt and empathized with the pain. But I think underneath that is a suggestion that the discursive identity is that the ex-Muslim identity is something adopted as a polemic. And I am not an ex-Muslim. I come from a very liberal family in which atheism was not a problem. So I have not had the struggles you had or any sense of being disbarred or not loved or any of those things. Um, but from the ex-Muslims and other atheists who have struggled with religious fundamentalism or other forms of religion, 
what I feel from you, and I, I'm going to turn to you, Jimmy, in a moment, is that it's as visceral to stand out as atheist as to say, I'm gay and I cannot live a lie. Mm -hmm. And in one of the, in one of the um, atheists who'd come out in the film, but she hadn't come out in her, uh, you know, on camera, she's very, very wrapped up. Uh, one of the women we know who that is, and I'm happy to say that she was talking about coming out to her family and how they wept and so on, but they have accepted her mm -hmm. as she is. And a lot of people said to her, why did you come out? Why did you put your family through that pain? She said, I couldn't carry on with them not knowing who I was, with not knowing who the man I live with was, with not knowing what my life is. I had to come out and tell them. And she did come through that. And, you know, has a life beyond that pain that you saw in the film. So Jimmy, um, I think uh, you are our last speaker, but not the least speaker. You're also, Jimmy is also a spokesperson for the Council of Ex-Muslims, was also very active uh, as both gay and ex-Muslim in the Pride event last year and in many of the discussions and so on afterwards, and uh, describes himself as a great gay British ex-Muslim Pakistani living in the UK he grew up in a traditional Pashtun family in London, where he struggled with both the homophobia and ardent misogyny within his community. He's written poems and prose about these experiences, many of which have been published in Zeda, which is a platform that the Khan set up. And as an ex LG, uh, as an ex, uh, as an, sorry, as an LGBT ex-Muslim activist, he's committed to unbridling the, the reins of patriarchy on gays and women of Muslim heritage. As a coach, he seeks to empower those individuals liberated from problematic ideologies to live a life of authenticity, self-assurance, and self-expression. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. I was having a conversation earlier with some of the people in the audience about this is the third time I've watched this movie and I feel more affected by it than any other time I've seen it. And I'm trying to contemplate as to why that was, actually, and we're having some dialogue. And I think I've nailed it now. I think the reason the movie was so poignant for me today was that this is the first time I'm at an ex-Muslim event where the leading dominant theme is also LGBT. Yeah. Because actually within this movement, it's a very heteronormative movement, sadly, because our numbers are few in terms of uh, our numbers are few in terms of gay Muslims, our numbers are few in terms of gay ex-Muslims as well. So um, it's really heartening to see this dialogue come to a forefront. In tandem with that, and I think what compounds the effectiveness that I feel, is the response that we got at uh, Gay Pride. And I think it's important to talk about Islamic homophobia. So Daniel, who I cannot help but applaud again. <laughs> the work he did to, to apply and get us into gay pride and then the systematic and structured and method method methodical way that he held meetings where he galvanized our volunteers and said, what are we marching for? And he helped construct a narrative through those meetings to say, actually, look at what is happening in Chechnya to uh, gay people who are being random, uh, rounded up and put into concentration camps. Mm -hmm. And so from that, we took this theme of actually Islamic homophobia needs to be challenged. It's not about marching in gay pride and making it about just ex-Muslims. Let's talk about the dialogue of Islamic homophobia that is impacting both gay Muslims and gay ex-Muslims in Muslim majority states. So to walk through the streets in gay pride and have people shouting and screaming and people jumping over barriers to come and hug Marian because we were finally giving voice to a dialogue that we never give voice to in public arenas. And to really celebrate the work that we did, although we were quite apprehensive, in fact, when we picked up our signs and walked into the streets because we didn't know what we were going to be met with because it was a brand new thing that we were doing. So receiving that support that we received on the streets and there was a lot of it, to then go home and the next day wake up to statements from gay Muslims and statements from gay pride and statements from secular newspapers calling us Islamophobes, 
was shocking and disappointing. And the absurdity of that needs to be captured, that whilst I'm reading an article in The Guardian, was it, or The Evening Standard, one of Evening those papers, Standard. in The Evening Standard, reading a, an article that uh, an activist colleague has sent me that is talking about me being an Islamophobe mm -hmm. after I've picked up my nephew from Quran school to drop him back to his, my sister's house. Mm -hmm. And then I'm standing in the butchers buying halal kima so my mum can cook us dinner, mm -hmm. whilst I'm reading about me being an Islamophobe, yeah. written in an article mm -hmm. by some Caucasian person yeah. who knows nothing about Islam or the lived realities and experiences yeah. of gays and ex-Muslim gays uh, of our heritage. <laughs> it was the most absurd thing to experience ever. And then to go through what was a one-year period of having to educate people that actually we, we are not anti-Muslim. Whilst we may be anti-Islam, we are not anti-Muslim. And there's a, 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 it's not even a nuance, actually. Those are two very distinct positions, and people need to take the time to educate themselves on someone can be anti a theology or uh, a political viewpoint, but that doesn't mean that they hate the person holding that viewpoint. Mm -hmm. One of the things in the film that we didn't see so much of, and I do a lot of coaching work internationally with ex-Muslims in Muslim-majority countries, like in Pakistan, in the UAE, in Saudi, and sometimes I'll have, be having a Skype coaching session with a lady who's wearing a hijab, and she lives in the house with her Muslim family, and she's an ex-Muslim. And what we didn't see so much of that was in the movie, that actually this idea of ex-Muslims in uh, opposition or anti their families is not always true. Like we have lots of ex-Muslims who are living in the same house as their mum and dad, but their mum and dad don't know that they're Muslim, they're ex-Muslim, and they're living in the closet. So the, the idea that ex-Muslims hate Muslims is just ludicrous. We are literally passing them the Quran sometimes, or helping our elderly grandparents to go and do their wadu so that they can pray. We are just anti-Islamic theology. That's all it is. We have no issue with, with, with the people themselves. And often, not is it only that we have no issue, but we actually have loving relationships and we are embedded in these communities as individuals who contribute to those communities. As teachers, even as... Um, wives to imams in some places, as parents, as siblings, uh, as uncles and aunties. And it's important that that is recognized in this term, or this methodology of labeling us as Islamophobes to silence our voices, is both pernicious and also extremely unsophisticated. I could go on forever, <laughs> and I heard the bell. So. No, you did, but I, I put the bell early, so you have some Okay, great. Okay. So, and I think, you know, when we talk about Islamic homophobia, so for myself, uh, my family discovered my, that I was gay at 23. I was disowned for about 10 years, and 10 years later, one of my brothers passed away. And death can often make people reassess their priorities. Yeah. So at that point I went back home and I started building relationships with my family again and they were more receptive to it having lost one of, uh, one of our siblings. And so that is, is an example of what Islam, Islamic homophobia can do to a family structure. Mm -hmm. And the story that Matt has just given us is another. And then we have, there, not so long ago there was a gentleman named uh, Javis Chowdhury who, who was positioned as one of the first gay Muslim people to get married. Uh, and uh, he's, he's up north in the UK. And after he got married, you know, he went on daytime TV and was celebrating his marriage. When he would walk down the streets, people in the community started spitting at him, started threatening him with acid attacks and such. And so then you saw him on television again uh, about a month later, apologizing to the community, apologizing to the Muslim community for having fallen in love and getting married because he was sorry if he offended people by saying that he was gay and he was Muslim and he would got married. And there's a nuance there that we don't often touch on because this debate is not LGBT-led, is that the idea that often, if you are gay and you declare yourself a gay Muslim, the dominant narrative within Islamic communities is that you are an apostate because they do not see that you can be gay, and they do not see that you can be Muslim as a cohesive 
uh, identity is. So if you declare yourself as gay, often within the Islamic community, automatically you are an apostate. So you would think that that would bring ex-Muslims and gay Muslims into some kind of alignment and uh, siding together, because actually there's a consistent um, hostility directed towards by the same groups. Mm -hmm. Sadly, we learn after Pride that that wasn't the case. And I want to speak specifically about one banner as I see the two-minute countdown on Gita's watch. <laughs> so, I, and I, the reason I want to touch on this one specific banner is because I had a conversation with a gay Muslim pastor about this banner. And they said to me, when you marched in gay pride, I saw in the Evening Standard, one of the banners you had said, fuck Islamic homophobia. But the fuck Islam was in red, and the ik homophobia was in a different color. So when you read that banner, it not only did it say fuck Islamic homophobia, it also said fuck Islam. And I said, great, I made that banner. Like I made that banner so you're speaking to the right person. And how was that interpreted when you read that? And the gentleman said to me that actually, when I saw that banner, it reminded me of my youth because it was something that EDL could have had yeah. or, or, or the National Front could have had. And immediately when I saw that banner, it, it brought back that sense of fear from essentially white racist people. And I said to them, I'm really pleased that you flagged that to me. Because let's look at that banner and let me explain to you why me, as a, a gay ex-Muslim who used to be a gay Muslim, designed that banner. So when I was growing up as, as, as a gay Muslim guy and I was looking through Quranic scripture for some validity to my existence, which I had been told several times had no validity, and actually that, that uh, execution was, uh, was a benevolent solution to, to my existence. And the dialogue around the method of my execution was so sophisticated that numerous scholars had to get involved. Is it beheading? Is it uh, stoning to death? Is it hanging? Like, what is the appropriate way to kill a gay who's Muslim? So when I would go through Islamic literature, and then I would go to the mosque and try and have a conversation about being gay and Muslim, and make sure it wasn't me that I was talking about because I was scared that I'd be identified as a gay Muslim. Back then, I didn't realize my voice gave it all away. <laughs> so, so I would be, I'd be afraid about them identifying me as gay. And... Again, from the Imam, the same thing about execution outside of the fold of Islam, being an apostate. When I would try to speak to family members about it, and somehow I thought, oh, the women will be more okay with this. Let me try and raise the dialogue. Same thing, is, is anti-Islam, throws you into apostasy, punishment is death. This consistent message towards me about my, my necessary annihilation in order to preserve some uh, religious pure, purity, yeah. I just thought, fuck Islam, mm -hmm. like fuck it. Fuck Islam, fuck Islamic homophobia, fuck Allah, fuck the community. Yay. And that was as Yay. a gay Muslim. Mm -hmm. So when I'm holding a sign that says, fuck Islamic homophobia, and your interpretation is, this is supporting the far right narrative, mm -hmm. it is not a nuanced understanding, nor a connected experience to my, ex my experience of living. Mm -hmm. okay. so, Being a bit liberal as a chair, uh, <laughs> but I think we needed to hear at length and um, also hear that although we really want to work together, there are also differences in the way we apprehend these issues because some of us don't think it's always misinterpretation. But I, as somebody who's an atheist who works with a secular Muslim and other secular people, who some of whom have some sort of faith and some many who don't. Uh, I, I do believe that people pick and choose their faith. Right? Yes. So I, I don't think that it's necessarily the text. I think it's the way people choose to live their lives. Yes. Whatever the text says, they can choose humanity over not humanity. Mm -hmm. But I think what a lot of people have grown up with, and I think it's actually the younger people, is a much more, f not just in Islam, but much more fundamentalist forms of religion. Yes. And I, you know, yes. and I think therefore that my friends who can choose to remain Muslim have actually grown up with a more liberal Islam yes. where they were more accepted in, my in terms of their choices. Yeah. I just turned 32, 
Um, but in my 32 years, I've seen women from my community, the Pakistani Muslim community, going from wearing just a loose dupatta on their head, so a very loose headscarf, to wearing not just a hijab uh, and a, uh, a full like a baya, but also wearing a niqab, and fully covering themselves up and becoming very, very religiously conservative in the last, let's say, maybe a decade, decade and a half or something. Um, so, yeah, young people in this country, young Muslims in this country, are certainly growing up with much, much more of a fundamentalist sort of ideology. Can I just touch on that? So, I think. Um, I think whilst I hear what you're saying about in terms of actually, it seems to be about the interpretation. So when you're working with people in, in Muslim majority countries, if you say to them actually, it's just this interpretation about apostates being killed, it's not, it's not actually Islam. I'd like to say that they'd laugh in your face, but no, they won't because, so I, I work with people who sometimes are on the verge of suicide. Mm -hmm. and. And their experience is not that this is some fringe interpretation of apostasy mm -hmm. or, or homophobia mm -hmm. that has, um, has them be positioned as being executed. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's a dominant norm. Yes. Yeah? And all of the, all if not most, of the narrative behind the respective scholarship and the, the, the history of Islamic doctrine supports that. So this, this narrative that we have now about the, the, the hadith, maybe they're not uh, authentic hadith, the story of Lut, that maybe it has a more um, broader interpretation and it wasn't completely just about homosexuality, it was about just bad people. Like, these are very recent um, uh, interpretations that have been brought to the forefront. And sometimes, and I'm not saying you know, I completely support anybody who wants to have this more inclusive Islam, like yeah. it's great. However, when you are speaking to people of Muslim heritage who are LGBT, and they are saying, actually, my community is talking about executing me. Mm -hmm. My family have just shunned me mm -hmm. for 10 years. Saying to them, oh, it's just interpretation. Like, it's just interpretation. People are just having the wrong interpretation. What it really means is Islam loves you, and God loves you even though you're gay. You might as well slap us in the face yeah. because yeah. you're telling us that we're mad, or you're telling us that we've misinterpreted what the community is saying. I want to disagree with you on one point. Actually, Definitely. one thing that you said that um, you know that you would support somebody who wants to kind of um, who kind of wants to talk about these misinterpretations. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think that it's a really dishonest position for them to take. For me, I actually, I can't stand those people. I think they're lying to our faces. I think that, you know, yes. that women like Yas Yasmin, they're, they're fantastic because they can say to us, and quite honestly say to us, yes, there's a problem in Islam, these things do exist, and actually what we need to do is move away from that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. rather than, you've got this wrong, mm -hmm. let's sit down and kind of discuss interpretations and stuff. Yeah. I think that's a wholly dishonest thing to say. And actually, not only that, those same individuals that want to talk about these misinterpretations are very hostile towards us. They're not willing to have a debate, they just want to sit and have a go at us. Yeah. I'm quite happy to have a debate, but they're never happy to have that debate. So that's an important And also the focus of that dialogue, so I'm, I'm completely comfortable that we have different positions on yeah, that, absolutely. With this is the thing with free thinkers, we, we never agree on anything. Apart <laughs> <laughs> um, from getting on the panel to say we don't agree. Um, so, um, so I think the other thing about that dialogue is whether you see it as disingenuous or not, because actually I feel like a lot of liberal Muslims feel like, no, this is the authentic interpretation. It makes sense when you look at the Quran as well. Great, if that's your position, great. But why are you telling me? Yeah. Go and tell the Imam at the, exactly, at the front exactly of the my point. Go and propagate this to the community so that then I can walk down the street behind you waving some, some gay flag. But not just that, I think a lot, of, a lot of this liberal progressive ideology that they think they have, they haven't they haven't got the fa most basic knowledge. You know, there was a woman um, in a BBC documentary, um, it was the end of last year, beginning of this year, uh, Marine Bear, she, she met three different kinds of Muslims, so like, like proper nutty Muslims, uh, we were painted as the other end of the extreme, and then like some like fluffy, cuddly Muslims in the middle. But she, the one thing she said in, uh, herself is actually, I've never read the Quran, but what I know for a fact is that it's quite um, 
Uh, it's a feminist religion. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, how do you know that? You never read the Quran. You're sat there saying to me, I've never read this book, but I know it's a feminist uh, ideology. I don't find that quite offensive, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I make one last point? Sorry, I wanted to touch on this. The and then I'll throw it back to the audience, yeah. honestly. There's this one other concept that I really struggle with, which seem to, we seem to get a lot as ex-Muslims or LGBT of, of, of Muslim heritage is this idea of not causing offence to, yes. to the dominant Muslim narrative. Yes. Yeah? That actually when you walk around with a sign saying uh, fuck Islam or fuck Islamic homophobia, or if you walk around with a sign saying I'm always gay because you know it's going to be provocative, yeah. that actually you're not challenging Islamic homophobia in the right way. <laughs> and this idea that yeah. as an oppressed minority who is marginalised <coughs> within the community, that I should challenge the, that I should challenge the the doctrine of my oppressor yeah. with a language that is palatable towards them is absurd. Sorry. It's literally absurd that I should challenge Islamic homophobia only with language that isn't blasphemous. Yeah. That doesn't work. In no civil rights movement have we seen where actually the oppressed minority or the marginalised group is challenging the narrative, do they do so in a way that is palatable with the oppressive group? You didn't see Rosa Park say, okay, I'll get off the bus, guys, because don't want to offend you guys, do you know what I mean? And you didn't see, the you didn't see Gandhi say, okay, we'll go, back to, to, we'll go back to doing our work because we shouldn't be here um, uh, protesting against you. It is part of civil rights movement to challenge the status quo, and that's often done in prolific and vulgar and uh, uh, you know, so verbally aggressive ways, yeah, yeah. not in terms of aggression physically. Well, I've been a very bad chair towards you as the audience because I did think that was a very interesting panel that it would be interesting to hear their views. Um, but we do have a few minutes uh, for questions, so if you have any questions or comments. Um, I'm going to take it first from people I don't know. <laughs> oh, there's the gentleman there in the middle. Yes, you. That's me. So, I'm echoing what Sadia just said very eloquently <clears throat> about um, those, uh, those make distinctions or, or, or find excuses. I, speaking from the point of view of the liberal, by formation, the, uh, the liberal um, Caucasian person, I have been, after having a relationship with a Pakistani person for many years and knowing the environment that ex-Muslims have to have to live live through and are actually really experience, I claim ignorance. And I was very ignorant of the situation, the sort of opposition, of all the ramifications of your the cultural resistance that you encounter have said. So I was liberal because I was a victim of self-inflicted censorship. And also it was inflicted censorship, by the way. I didn't know. We don't understand, we liberals don't understand what, for example, being disowned by the family means in all the corollaries, you know, being exposed to loneliness and, and enslavement in Pakistan and sexual servitude, etc. Because you just think you know, your mom and dad don't talk to you anymore. So it's whereas you're actually out in the street and you, you become a moving target. How can you speak to the people like me? Because, of course, and we've experienced censorship, but recently there was a, 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 an Amnesty International panel that what question on the uh, Muslim girls' education has been entirely censored by yeah. like well-meaning people. How can you speak more loudly to people like the former me? You said it's an Amnesty International panel? There was a panel, I'm sorry, it's a panel about feminism, yeah. about the, so, the suffragette anniversary. There was a question about how the feminist um, uh, message was being was was being communicated through two different communities, right? I, I asked a question to say that how can we call out practices that hurt girls, that deny girls equal access to opportunity within cultures and communities, and those girls come to our workshops and say it is because of my religion that this is happening. How do we call those out without being called racist, exactly. bigots, Islamophobes? And the two times that I raised it, I was myself called one. Uh, the whole room frowned. Yeah. yeah okay. So 
But this is out of ignorance, so right? A question. No. no, it's not out of ignorance, but, but uh, that's a question that we take both those questions. Is there anybody else? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm so glad I came. And I really would urge you to consider having round the table discussions that you might live stream because it, it, was, it was so um, magnificent. So that's um, something we're going to yeah. be doing soon. We're Brilliant. Going to be doing like head to head debates soon. I'm curious about the role of tolerance in promoting what I see as a neoliberal agenda. And I don't think it's ignorance, I think it definitely. Um, reinforces the power and uh, authority of the dominant um, upper class white straight guys and mm -hmm. you know and what we've got I don't, didn't quite understand the reading thank you for being so generous about that when you read that chat I thought oh I'm out of my depth here you know but I do kind of in a sense I hope uh, I, I picked up we've got this identity politics right I'm what I say I am which is fine if you're a straight white guy, um, but for those of us who, you know, are trying to live and express ourselves, our, our, our way of life, whether it's lesbianism or, um, or being gay, whatever, um, what am I saying? Yeah, um, I think that um, they've kind of, they seem to have taken over and, and, and we've got away from the old kind of Marxist material basis, right, for what, what we can actually do and how we can actually live. And now it's all about how we identify and not offending anyone. Not offending anyone. And what the left have done, it seems to me, is they have abandoned the material basis and they've left the space for anyone to come in, and, and the right wing actually, to come in and say, uh, you know, that anybody who questions um, patriarchal religious ideology, which is deeply offensive and oppressive to women and gay people, um, uh, they've, they've, they've left the, the ground to the, to the right wing. So now any time we say that's really offensive and, you know, how can we support Muslim girls, for God's sake, and gay boys, right? What, you know, I've, I'm a teacher. I feel like I've got to try and do my bit for the, for the next generation, you know? And, uh, and any time we try and do that, um, we get this shit hurled at us. Yeah. Yes. Does that yes. make sense? Yeah, completely. Yeah, thank you. Is there anybody else? Um, I just have a question. Um, it's for you, Mr. Uh, probably you're the only in the panel which is not ex-Muslim yet. Mm -hmm. So I just feel because a uh, couple of uh, two weeks before I just attended a uh, big gay star uh, in the center in the central London near Liverpool and. Uh, one uh, website which is called munchies.com we just publish a uh, something on a site and some of uh, my uh, people around they just see me in, in that particular picture and everything and they just uh, you know recognize me and they just said okay mm -hmm. so uh, you're a gay you uh, we heard about the avatar parties but we never heard about the gay avatar and stuff and then they just uh, you know um, didn't allow me to pray with them and they just said, uh, if you are a gay, you're just out of Islam. So how you still uh, in association with Islam, how they didn't, uh, uh, you know, yet throw you out of Islam, and how you still uh, in, in that circle? Uh, I didn't really, because it, this was the only uh, one event. You, you, you can uh, be in a star dinner, gay star dinner. This is not necessarily that you're a gay or you're... Uh, there was because there was Christians as well, there was uh, Jewish as well. Mm -hmm. There was uh, all the religions and uh, uh, was there in a, in that Tower party. But they just seen my picture uh, in that uh, on the Facebook page and they just you know didn't allow me to pray with them. They said, "Oh, you are out of town now." So I said, uh, "Actually, this what uh, decided by the muftis who uh, give the fatwas. None of them was the mufti, but they decided that I am out of town now." And they didn't allow me to <coughs> pray with them. So I said, it's all right, good enough. I just uh, came back home. And since uh, yesterday, I, uh, because I'm, I'm not very, uh, you know, kind of uh, practicing, but because of the month of Ramadan, I was fasting. And I, I sometimes occasionally going to mosque as well. Mm -hmm. So after, after that, that attitude, I didn't even fast yesterday and today as well. Because it, it hurts. Mm -hmm. uh, I. I don't know, 
I, I can't understand how to tackle with this attitude. That's why I just want to know from you that how you're still associated with the religion. Are you still Muslim? No, no, no. It's like I'm, a, I'm an atheist. Oh, you like now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just so you know, um, there were, we went to the gay iftar as well. Some of us went yeah, I seen, to show I seen our support. You, yeah. Because we were like, actually, like Sadia says, for us, we will never, ever, ever step away from gay Muslims. As far as I'm concerned, they're my brothers mm -hmm. in the struggle, mm -hmm. and my sisters in the struggle. Mm -hmm. We That whole film you saw, if you substituted the word ex-Muslim for gay, mm -hmm. it would still make the same sense, the same things would have occurred. Mm -hmm. So when we see gay Muslims and they don't align with us, we're so keen to have this dialogue and these kind of conversations because we want to know, what is that about? Let's, 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 Let's find where the commonality is, and it's not about you mustn't be offended, we mustn't be offended. We can offend each other and still be aligned in our struggle. And that just takes me to one point in the movie that, you know when the gentleman was saying, yeah, but if you look through the lens of Islam, then your son or daughter has fallen, and you can't expect them to have the same kind of relationship with, with their child if they've fallen out of Islam. The truth is, that that is a fallacious idea, yeah? And it is completely possible. My mum loves me just as much as she ever did, <laughs> knowing that I'm gay and I'm an ex-Muslim. In some ways, she probably loves me more because she's really getting to see who I am. And when she says to me, I'll oh, marry, I'll get this girl from Pakistan who's your <laughs> second cousin, <laughs> we can get you married to her. And I'm like, has she got a brother? <laughs> you know, my mum will laugh with me yeah, now yeah, at yeah. those kind of jokes. Yeah, yeah. And she, in some ways, she loves me more because she is in love with the authentic child that she had, yeah. rather than some farcical figure. So this idea that we cannot love our children if they fall out of Islam or step outside of Islam, it's fallacious and it's completely possible to do so. It just requires some emotional maturity and sophistication. And, and the will. And the will. The will of your parents. And the honest, in honest truth, though. And that will isn't always there. We're not, and we're not yeah. necessarily on that level of emotional maturity or sophistication yeah. as an Islamic community. And we need to put our hands up and say there is some development and growth here that we need to take on board. Yeah. Yeah. But you will ask questions about material. My my dad has died. You ask okay. questions about materialism. Uh, there was a question about raising issues about yes. really, you know, women saying that it's my religion that's pressing me and sure. then being shut down in human rights debates so, around these so things. I just want to touch on one of so the questions you, and then I'll hand it yeah. with somebody else. So, listen, I think, I think let's... The whole straight white male thing comes up a lot, yeah? Mm -hmm. And actually, straight white men, I love you, if you're out yeah. there. <laughs> like, I really do. And I was on a podcast the other day, and so one of the straight white men messaged in and said, actually, I want to stand for gay rights in Muslim communities, mm -hmm. and I want to stand for ex-Muslim gay rights. But every time I try and do so, I'm labeled as a straight white male, I'm told I've got too much privilege, and I should shut up and stop being a racist. Mm -hmm. What should I do? Mm -hmm. And my response to that is keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like just keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It is our responsibility where we see a compromise of human rights and civil liberties to place that under scrutiny via uh, uh, a magnifying glass or a microscope and call it out. And it is not sustainable forever that we can keep on calling straight white men or anybody else racist because we're talking about female genital mutilation. Yeah. That, that just won't, that narrative will not stay around forever. The more of us who stand up and we call out the atrocities that we see committed in the name of Islam or because of Islam, and we have those dialogues, the swifter that pendulum will swing in the other direction. The difficulty is, that, so I've, in terms of the women's sector, uh, I've been working in the women's sector for the last decade in various capacities. And I think actually sometimes uh, I've probably come across as a bit pessimistic because I feel like the, the issues that you were talking about are still very prevalent within the police, within social care, within health. Um, and actually, uh, the more human rights organisations tend to be like the worst offenders, the police tend to be the worst offenders, mm -hmm. social care, health, again, the worst offenders. Um, they'll pander to the, uh, the perpetrators, the abusers, the oppressors, rather than listen to and support the victims. Um, and we find that with ex-Muslim issues, most certainly. Uh, and we definitely find that with women's issues. 
Um, you know, Banaz Mahmood was murdered 12 years ago now in Britain. Fuck all has changed. And you start talking about it and they get confrontational. The police are one of the worst offenders for this. Hold a mirror up to their mass, ma, uh, malpractices and they will, they will charge at you rather than go, oh, <coughs> right, I've done something wrong here. I could learn from this. Um, and in the first instance, when I was doing this work, um, I was actually a lot less confrontational. Now, my back is up. I'm pissed off because of the double fucking standards. And it's just institutional racism. So the things that definitely still exist, mm -hmm. institutional racism, mm -hmm. institutional sexism, mm -hmm. all of these inequalities still ex exist, mm -hmm. right? And like I said, the police are one of the worst offenders for this. Where's well, the oldest old boys club in, in, in the country, right? Um, they look after their own. They don't like being told what to do. They don't like being told when they're wrong. Um, so we just carry on. Uh, and they have religious bodies with alliances, alliances with religious bodies, yeah. which are some of the worst offenders. Exactly. So, and, and that's true of the human rights organizations as well. So it's not an accident that you were shut down. It's completely coherent yeah. uh, with the policies they've taken. That it's dangerous for people to blame religion, they can't actually, so even the person within the religion is, you know, forget the white man talking about it, they yeah. definitely can't speak, they're not allowed to have a voice, whether they're on the right well, side or not. they can if they call themselves trans. Well, only, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But, but, I was actually watching Stand Up by Dave yeah. Chappelle the other day, and he's fantastic. And one of the things he said, one of the reasons we're talking about trans movements right now, as we are, is because it's affecting white men. So just bear that in mind. So that's one thing. But the other thing I just wanted to throw in there. Um, so two years ago, the Metropolitan Police, some police of this area, um, created a body within the police that was there to provide theological advice. What that... I don't think the police, that's not the police's role. My tax, my tax money isn't there to be providing theological fucking advice, mm. right? Uh, one of their police officers, and you can actually find this clip on ITV News. It's, it is easy to find. Um, I use it regularly, in fact. Um, the police uh, had have have this unit. This woman was bringing up issues with, from within this unit uh, in relation to certain police officers, um, she took the concerns to her seniors, the seniors questioned her, is this in relation to the um, officers in the religious um, attire, when she said yes, they said we have had concerns too. In the end, she was expected to leave the force. The force. And she's not the only one. She's not the only one. And she, she's not the first, she certainly won't be the last. Because we're not kicking, we need to kick back against them. And we are. All it does is it makes us increasingly unpopular. Mm -hmm. So, you want to say to respond? And then Matt to respond to some of the questions? Matt's white, he should respond. We should have yeah, not straight. Yeah, not straight. No. <laughs> uh, I'd like to I'd like to say on the gentleman's question. Uh, it's like a, from my personal experience. I think being gay and Islam it cannot uh, go together. My personal experience is that because like once we had a um, uh, like uh, last year we were uh, trying to organize a little. Um, get together between the, um, the gay community from Bangladesh. We have a few members there. And we booked a restaurant, um, I mean, not the whole restaurant, a part of the restaurant just for the dinner. And as soon as we arrived there, they got to know that this is an LGBT community and they kicked us out and they said that uh, we are not allowed to be there. And one of us, uh, he was arguing, they called the police, and when the police arrived, the police said that this is a discrimination. I mean, they went that further, they thought like they, they could call the police. They didn't have any idea that this is in the UK. <laughs> this is discrimination. So, uh, this is one of the things. And secondly, one of, our, one of our 
um, one of our group member, he still practices most, uh, Islam and he's banned from the Istanbul mosque huh. because of uh, he's uh, gay. He's banned from there and uh, that, that's the case. So I think from my personal experience, being gay and being Muslim, it's not, uh, it's not, I mean, you will not be welcome. You can practice, it's up to you, but you will not be welcome uh, by the, the, the community. The East London Mosque is a very particular mosque. I mean, there are many others that are also very intolerant, but that is one that is dominated by the Jamaat Islami, which has been one of the leading voices in promoting blasphemy laws, death penalties for people on account of their sexuality, on account of uh, having sex outside marriage, on uh, blasphemy, and so on. So, uh, and and it has people uh, who are trustees of it, who were death squad leaders, who are actually involved with killings in '71. So, I mean, they have a very, very violent history and a violent present in terms of some of the stuff you saw uh, in the film. But there is an inclusive mosque initiative where people do meet, where you would be welcomed. I, I think. Um, and the gay star was an example of gay Muslims crafting their own space. If the wider community is not going to give you a space, then craft it yourself and take it and, and prove I'm your existence. I'm with, with the Hidayah and Iman as well. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's what give you the uh, courage to stand with your faith. Exactly. Because uh, when you just meet people... I, I was so confused uh, in, in the beginning being, being a gay and a Muslim. Uh, and since I just uh, came out, uh, Matt really helps me in, in that particular way. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the guys from the Hidayah and Iman. And I, I seen uh, hundreds of LGBT Muslims there, which which really gives me the courage to come out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, when, when I just come out, uh, the people, obviously now more and more people just uh, coming, uh, they just uh, know about me that I'm again. Yeah, they just did it and they're just uh, about to ban me from the mosque now. Whatever they're going to do. Uh, it's alright, there's, uh, if, if they won't allow me to uh, pray in the mosque, I'll pray at all. Yeah, and I think this is one of the reasons we reach out to gay Muslim organizations, because it's so important to hear your voice, because you'll hear our voices, but we need to hear those gay Muslim voices amongst our voices to give a different perspective as well. And I think what's important is that whilst you're doing that here in the UK, often we see with social movements that you can start something in the UK and internationalize to a Muslim majority country. So you existing as gay Muslims will give breadth and strength to gay Muslims in Muslim majority countries. And even since yesterday, I was just thinking that probably the apostasy is a byproduct of being a gay. They're just uh, giving me uh, the gift, being, uh, being a gay, yeah. And if, if you're a gay, they just make two things, uh, you know, uh, connecting. If you're a gay, you, you are a... Uh, I'd, I'd like to have Matt say something because we need to wrap up. We're running over time. So. Oh, really quick, really yeah. quick. I think the, the thing that I've learned the most is, is really the is really the most important gift is to is just to listen. First of all, just listen to what the other person is saying. And in my experience, not necessarily to react at that moment, but to actually give it a lot of thought to what they're saying. And the example is that although our journey, um, sadly, Naz, Naz is no longer here, in large because of the beliefs of his parents. A religion was not part of our life, our daily life. And so, for me, overnight I've been thrown into a world where there's, there's, I hear lots of different voices and different, different angles and different people saying, well, this is definitely the right way, this is definitely the right way. And really, the, the only way to navigate through that is to, is to listen as much as we possibly can and then take action based on our own beliefs and what we feel is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's going to be different for everybody else, but first of all, just listen to your other human being and just be respectful, mm -hmm. if possible. I but sometimes you don't, you can't. Yeah, that's a very good note to end on. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say that there is a common enemy. I don't, I don't like to use that word very often, mm -hmm. but I think it is where, where we do need to leave some common understanding that we can be gay and religious, Muslim or otherwise, uh, uh, we can be ex or atheist, uh, and we can survive, and we can have a public identity in that way as well. But the fundamentalists, and some of them say the, the homophobia and the apostasy laws in religions themselves yeah. are a source that are a threat to both. Yes. And I think we need to understand them. So yeah. allying with one to prove one part of your identity is really not a good idea. And I think, therefore, if we can get that understanding amongst all of us here, yeah. 
because that was the source of our distress, yes. was the attacks from people that we thought were our natural allies. Yeah. And I think tonight we've actually discussed the ways in which we can work with these differing opinions, but actually work because it is a common struggle, and we hope we'll all be in pride together this year. Thank you. Thank you.